Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is blogger Sean Dietrich, known to his thousands of followers as Sean of the South. Dietrich is a pioneer in the new literary form, the blog. His daily blogs are read by over 100,000 people. I spoke with Sean Dietrich in the Monroe County Courthouse during the annual Alabama Writers' Symposium in Monroeville, Alabama. Well, Sean Dietrich, it's nice to meet you. You are known as, famous as even, Sean of the South. And the first thing that came to my mind was that this was a a kind of playful take on Sean of the Dead. Actually, it's a it's it's a take on the Song of the South by Alabama or the old or the old Disney show, Uh Song of the South. Uh, But I a lot of people say remind me of Shaun of the Dead, which I've never seen. <laughs> well, why not? Why don't you just go ahead and watch it? Uh, that's, not, that's not quite my genre. I, I would be more akin to watch something like Andy Griffiths than I would Shaun of the Dead, although I hear it's pretty funny. I, I, it is a spoof of, I think, uh, I think it is a spoof of monster, vampire, uh, goo, uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking uh, for? Horror movie type. Uh, horror movie, That's yeah. why I wouldn't watch it. Yeah. I, People, you have a huge following in Alabama, and you even have a a a, 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 a lot of your stuff set in Alabama. Are, are you an Alabamian? I'm not. I've never lived in Alabama, at least not formally. My wife is from Alabama, and uh, she's from a little town called Bruton, hmm. and they embraced me uh, when we met. And so we spent a lot more time in Bruton than we did at home there for a long time, but but uh, Alabamans are who I identify with, and I I can't really tell you why. It just happened that way. Well, where were you you actually born and raised? I was born in Missouri. I was born in Missouri, and we lived all over because my father was a steel worker, and so Mm -hmm. he was what you call a boomer, and he would travel to different places. We we spent some time in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Uh, We've been in North Carolina. Uh, After he passed when I was 13, we were we were gypsies, uh, transient. We lived in Oklahoma. Uh, we lived with my aunt and uncle in Atlanta, Georgia, and we finally settled in Walton County, Florida, which is where I call home, and that's where I've been the longest. And so, right on the Chalkahatchee Bay, that's home. And your education is unusual. Yeah, my education is non-existent. When my, when I was uh, <laughs> when I when my mother when, after my father passed, my mother kind of reverted into a kind of a shell shock. Uh, he committed suicide when I was 12 years old. And she, she, we lived too far from town uh, for the school bus. And in that state of mental frenzy, I dropped out in the seventh grade. And so I never attended a day of school after that. Uh, I worked, I worked uh, construction jobs and uh, menial, menial jobs. And when I was in my mid twenties, uh, I was already married. I went back to receive my high school education uh, at, at Okaloosa Walton Community College, or actually at the time I think it was Okaloosa Community College. No, it was OW. And then they, they changed their name to Northwest Florida State, and that's also where I got my college education. And uh, it was a life-changing experience for me. My education was something I had to really work for. And did you study writing and literature? No, I never did. I mean, no what more than- What did you study? <laughs> <laughs> I studied mainly music. I, I thought for a long time music would be my thing. I, I've sung in church since I was a kid. Uh, and there's that music was a big part of my life. I'm a pianist uh, since age nine and a guitarist. Uh, and uh-huh. not, not good at either. But I was gonna do music. That's what I wanted to do. And that didn't work out for me because that's a pretty hard, hard world to get oh, into. Sure. And so I started writing when I kind of was met with a little series of failures uh, musically. All right, when you started to, well, maybe even back off one more second. You must have read. I mean, oh, yes. you don't write without having read something. No, did, I read. What, what when, did you like to read? Okay, uh, well, everything. When, when I dropped out of school, 
uh, I really, I was embarrassed, uh, big time embarrassed. I felt beneath everybody that, I, that was my age and even everybody older than me. And so I frequented the library a lot and I got a stack of books every week on any subject I could. I could. Uh, there, was a, there was a lady, a librarian, in, a little, in all sorts of libraries, uh, they, uh -huh. took, they took special interest in there me. There is often a librarian. Yes. Bless them. So they would give me books on, on biology and botany and math and all that, and I, old westerns and uh, uh -huh. fiction, nonfiction. I read it all. I read it all. I loved Louis Grizzard. He was my favorite uh, pastime, like I told you earlier. Uh, Catherine Tucker Wyndham, love her. Uh -huh. uh, I, I read it all. And somewhere along in here, you decided that what Catherine was doing or what Lewis was doing, some in an, in your own way, you could do it. I I did. We were my wife and I were on vacation. I was a wayward soul. I didn't know where what I was going to do. And I wrote a, my first story while on vacation uh, for a you know as a as a blog entry. And the story was about it was humorous. It was about me going fishing with my cousin after eating too much fiber for a week and it ended in disaster <laughs> while I was fishing. And it got such a positive response and I became known as the fisherman who, who soiled his pants <laughs> there for a short period, which is not exactly a literary <laughs> title you want to bear. Uh, and so after that, I started writing humorous stories. I knew I had a knack for it. I really thought I, had, I was onto something. And, um, after that, I started digging into more of my own personal life, getting a little deeper, and then I started writing about people I met, and it just kind of mushroomed. All right. When you began writing, did you begin by sending to what we would understand as print outlets? No. Magazines, no. newspapers? Well, no. sort of. Uh, I, did, I did try to get uh, some things published in magazines. Well, but you I, did. You have had. I have. Yes, yeah, I have now. Sure. At first, that's how I started. That was all I really knew. And I was met with a, with a sort of an elitism attitude uh, from the, the modern publishing industry. You know, those who know people get more, and I didn't know anybody. So that's what propelled me into publishing in the digital world. I'd always wanted a newspaper column. That would have been my, my ultimate dream, would, would have been to have a newspaper column. And it suddenly occurred to me that blogging was the new column. So that's... It, it is. It is. And... Although there are several generations between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> Not many. <laughs> I, I do understand that that's true. So one publishes a blog. Yes, sir. Someone reads it. And now you publish, and I, I, I've mentioned this to you just, just in passing, but here in Monroeville, you really have a lot of fans. <laughs> I've been told by any number of people that they read you every day, and I've been told by some people that they read your blog first thing in the morning. Yeah, yes. Well, you would have to come after coffee for, <laughs> for me. But, but all right, it, this is true. Do you have any idea how many people read your blog? Uh, I have a reach of about 120,000 currently. 120,000 read me, uh, and, and it comes out and different outlets, so that's a conglomerate, but uh, it comes out first thing in the morning, but on Facebook it comes out at 11.27 every night, and I stay up till 11.27 to post it every every single night. Uh-huh. And, and there are people who stay up that's to right. read it. That is, that's and true. And there are other people who get up to read it. That's right. Everybody has their own time. As some, There's one, of, one friend of mine in Columbia and Alabama. He, I know that when I see his name pop up on my phone that he is in the bathroom while he's reading. Because <laughs> right. that's, tra that's his tradition. All right. Now, I do not need to see your income tax returns. Because I'm not, I, I will pry a little. Uh, sure, but, sure. But, you know, but finally, you, your, your finances are your business. But you have found a way to write a piece, put it on the Internet, and make a living. So how, what is the connection? How does it all work? Well, I should say before I even say much about it is it's all accidental. You know, I don't have this formula or anything figured out. When I first started my blog, the one thing I did know was that I did not want to entertain advertisers because when I go to to, to blogs or sites that are just inundated with ads, yes. uh, it's overwhelming and it takes away from the impact of, of why you're there. 
so that was my, my start goal <laughs> was not to do that. Where I make my primary income is, is through book sales. That's a little bit of it. And through speaking engagements, I, I go, I, we have been in this past year, we have been on the road for just about 90% of this year. I'm hardly ever at home. As a matter of fact, we moved out of our house, which is across the street from where I live now. I own the lot across the street. It's a dirt lot with a camper on it. And my wife and I live in that camper when we're at home. And I have another camper that is my office. So we're hardly there. So we are always speaking. I've spoken, I would venture to say, this past year at, at most of the small towns in Alabama. I've been very fortunate. Well, out of 365 days, have you spoken 10, 20, 100 times? How many times? <laughs> well, I seriously, I couldn't really tell you that. But I, what I can tell you is right now we're on the we've been on the road for the last 20 days. And most every month for about 20 to 25 of those days, we are on the road out of every month. And most, I would say, I speak four times a week. That is amazing and exhausting. It totally is. And I've gotten to meet a lot of the, the readers up close and personal. Sure, sure. Just last night we spoke I spoke them in Roval and through the line came two ten year old or two sixth grade girls who had written me, handwritten me letters and they read me every morning. It it'll touch you. It'll touch oh, you. I've, all right. I've been humbled. All right. You if you're producing a piece of work every day. Yes, sir. Like any columnist. You have to have something to write about. That's you right. You have to find, and I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter. It can be, you can be a sports columnist, a political columnist, right. an arts columnist, whatever it is, if you're going to do it every day or even once a week, you have to have something to write, write right. about. So I'll ask you the question that everyone asks you, and what, is, what are the sources of all of those hundreds of blogs? Oh, they come from everywhere. I would say... The first thing I look for is something, well, first I should say is they, they find me. They find me now, it seems like. Like just yesterday, I was setting up uh, the sound system upstairs in the courtroom to do our, to do our show. And while I'm setting up, a, a man comes in, he's a tourist, looking around at the Monroeville Courthouse and we get to talking. And he's from Indiana and his wife, was a black woman and he is a white woman and they were married and in love and he wanted to walk after she passed last year from cancer he wanted to go on the civil rights trail and in, in honor of her well we start to talk and, and the story just starts forming itself I'm, I'm getting a sense of his life and that, that just happened to me we had breakfast this morning and kept talking about it I see things I hear things I get about a hundred emails every day from people uh, all over the U.S. who have seen something good happen in um, in, in society, yeah, and, yeah. And they have found they have chosen me as that outlet to to divulge what they've seen. You know, somebody saved a dog from four lanes of traffic. You know, or, yeah, or yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. gave an extra big tip to the or waiters. found a dog that had been missing for ten years. That's right. That's right. But it had a chip in it. Had a chip in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Good, good things find me like that. I have a lot of, of life experience for somebody so young because of the hairy past that we had. And then the, the last thing I'd say is I come from my mother who has a, a Gabby streak. So I am a natural born talker like you can tell right now. Once you get me started, it's hard to get me to shut up. So if you can just do that and move your fingers at the same time on a keyboard, you're a writer. So people come up to you with stories. People email you stories. You have your own life history. Right. Do you do what you would loosely call research? Do you read the paper, the, the magazines, uh, yes, news sir. feeds? Sometimes. Uh, I try to keep that to a minimum because uh, I'm not crazy about what the, what the uh, powers that be uh, behind the media outlets uh, centralize and put their spotlight on. Uh, I feel like there's so many people who get overlooked, and I feel like those are my people. My people are the ones who are overlooked. Uh, and so they're... Who, 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 let me interrupt you, Yes, sorry. sir. Who do you define, when you say my people, you have something in mind. Yes. What uh, is that? Uh, the people who feel like nobody sees them. People who feel like they, uh, they, they're just not, they're not getting uh, any attention mm -hmm. in life, and but they... 
and they might feel maybe perhaps downtrodden because I can identify with that. That's how I felt for most of my life. Last night, my wife and I went to Huddle House after the, the thing we did upstairs, and I watched a boy, might have been 19 or 20, clean the Huddle House grill. Yeah. And he took about 15 minutes cleaning that grill, and it was it was like an art to watch him do it. Nobody sees him, you know. Who, who's going to write about him? Well, I want to be that guy. That's how I feel. Yeah. Do you? I read a whole lot of of your pieces. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> and they're well, honestly speaking, they're not meant to be read. It's, they're not meant for anybody to sit down and read 30 of them at a crack, <laughs> because that's that's not how they're meant right. to be delivered. So right. I had to kind of keep that in, in mind. It, it's all, it was really more uplift and, and yeah. more positive than, than my cynical soul could stand. <laughs> but that's, that's not your problem. Uh, that's my problem. I hear you. But, but uh, do you ever write about, I mean, do you think of yourself as sunshine? Do you think of yourself as always looking for the... For the, the, the no, I didn't. I didn't. And I, I have never thought of myself as that way. Uh, but it's kind of, I guess, naturally happened. I, I'm an Andy Griffith fanatic. Uh -huh. Fanatic. I've seen every episode at least 100 times. I try to get in at least one or two daily episodes in a day. Uh, and I realized he, there was a song he sang in, in season two, and it was just a 10-second snippet. He wrote it, I found out, and it was spread a little sunshine every day, spread a little sunshine every day, help someone along life's way, spread a little sunshine every day. Right. And I, when I heard it, it connected with me so, so much because I'd forgotten about that little song that, that I realized, okay, maybe this is what I am and maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. So, uh, well, sure. I like sunshine, so why not? Well, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, for people who aren't, for the few people left in America who are not apparently <laughs> yeah. reading your blog, would you read us some, absolutely. some bits from different blogs that you think are representative of different, of different, Types or kinds or whatever. Absolutely, just little, little bits. We've, okay. we've got a, we've got a few minutes left okay. here. Okay, uh, this is one I have. I've kind of put these in their own category. I call these good, and these are just short snippets in journalistic style of things I've seen that are good. Uh, okay. New Orleans, Louisiana. I saw a homeless man playing guitar. His Labrador sat nearby, and his singing voice sounded like a tin bucket scraping against concrete. The man's cardboard tip box was overflowing. The folks took turns throwing handfuls of money in, and then they stroked the dog. The man said he'd found the dog underneath the bridge years earlier. And when he found her, she was even skinnier than he was. He gave her all the food he had, and he went to bed hungry that night. This is my girl the man said, patting that Labrador's rib cage, And I thank God every day for her. And she's my biggest moneymaker, too. Without her, we wouldn't eat. People just love this dog. But not as much as he does. Mobile, Alabama. Inside a Target, a woman's purse fell from her cart, and she didn't know it. Without skipping a beat, a scruffy boy wearing a hoodie came behind her, he gathered the contents, then chased after her, and he said, Ma'am, ma'am, you dropped your purse. You should have seen the look on that woman's face, and you should have seen the look on mine. Pensacola, Florida, a parade downtown. I watched an old man struggle to keep up with his family. He moved slow with a walking stick, and then his knees fell first onto the sidewalk before the rest of his body did. The noise of the crowd drowned out his shouts. Immediately, two college girls stopped to help him up, and they escorted him along the sidewalk, one girl for each arm. There are worse things in this life than being escorted by two college girls down the sidewalk. <laughs> Instead, they spent the next few hours with him rather than watching the floats go by, and if you've ever seen an old man happier, you're hard-pressed to find another. Selma, Alabama. Bo hunts deer. He processes the meat himself and makes it into ground venison sausage and steak. Then he takes it to the nursing home where his mother lives and he stocks the cafeteria freezer. Bo says, I ain't even eaten my own deer meat in years. Mama and all her boyfriends eat it all up. Thursday night is chilly night. Bo plays guitar for his mama like the 
like the aforementioned boyfriends would like him to do. And he plays songs like Little Brown Church in the Vale and Old Rugged Cross. And Bo says, I do it because they can't get out for Sunday service anymore. I do it because I just love singing. Now here's where I get redundant. I watched the news last night and I'm sorry I did. The broadcast showed our world crumbling, complete with video footage. Violent crimes, shootings, and blood-curdling pharmaceutical commercials. Terrorists killing people, people killing terrorists, and politicians killing both. Another day and another senseless act of politics. Hell is a remote control away. You can see it anytime you want, which is probably why folks think there's more hate out there than there is love. And well, who knows? Maybe they're right. But I know a Labrador in New Orleans who believes otherwise. Do you watch the evening news? When I do, I'm sorry I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> occasionally, occasionally, not much. Not much, only because I realized it was starting to make me feel bad, really, truly. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> like, I mean, the, the, a lot of people feel that way. Yeah, I feel like news used to be 15 to 30 minutes, right? Now it's an hour long. I guess it takes that long to get it all out, the bad news. Well, there's a lot of killing. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to watch. But have you noticed how, what the last four minutes of the evening news is? Oh yeah, like it's a, Shaun of the South. I, you're right about that. Well, not Shaun of the South. Well, but it is somebody. They have sent some reporter to go find the good, the the Labrador Retriever, or the woman who's dropped her purse. Well, see, now I could I could have that job. I could do with. I'd like that. I'd like to do that. You could do that. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that. That's that's. It's right up your alley. For someone who has written, at this point, a million words, <laughs> do you think of yourself now as a reader? As a reader? Yeah. As you move along from day to day, some writers are readers, some are not. Pat Conroy, for example, spent two or three hours every day reading because he loved it. Really? Other writers don't touch it. Well, I would say when I'm in a strong writing phase, which has been for the last four years, uh, I have read very little mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it all it, it it affects my voice like like I told you earlier. It, you you mentioned something about not reading Rick Bragg. Rick Bragg right. is a regular on this program, is and he'll right? be interested to hear Ouch. why you don't read him. God, he'll probably hate no. It's me. a good thing. He'll hate me for it, maybe. But uh, <laughs> someone gave me a book called Ava's Man a long time ago. I read the first chapter and I I, I had to set it down. I said, this is so damn good that uh, I cannot. I cannot read this guy because I'm going to start unwittingly emulating his his voice. Yeah, yeah. So I've never read another lick of him. Uh, he, he was one of the best writers I ever ever read, though. You know, for that that brief moment. I don't read much. I don't read much because uh, I spend. I write about 500 words a day on on a good day, 650. Yeah. Or sometimes if I write two or three of these columns in a day, that's, that's a big day. And then I spend the rest of the day editing. So I stare at words all day long. Uh -huh. I, I, I ain't got nothing left uh -huh. <laughs> to, to read. <laughs> oh, and your wife is your manager, uh, editor, agent? Everything. She's my everything. She's the reason, she's the reason I got through college, for one thing. She's a math, she was a math teacher and a chef. Uh, there's our type A personalities and there are type me personalities. She's, she's my motivating everything. So she books everything, all the speaking engagements. Uh -huh. She serves as my editor uh, a lot. Um, so yeah, she's... And you have published several novels. Yes, sir. Well, two. The, two. Is it two? Yeah, two I novels. I thought it was more. But it, this is a slightly different, this is a different mental process. But yes. yet it's a process that you feel strongly enough about to do it. Fiction is my first love. Fiction is uh, fiction comes natural to me because fiction centralizes more on the story and less on research. So I love to, I love to weave a good yarn in fiction because uh, you can say things they don't have to, they don't have to make any logical sense. But mm -hmm. I find that they end up making more logical sense than than reality. Which and the novels are set. One is set in Pensacola. That's called Bay. Well, uh, it's it's a fictional town. Well, but it's sent, it's around. It's like that. Yes, yeah. yes, sir. And the other, the other is Apalachicola, it, or around Franklin County. Uh, that's at least where it's set. Uh, it it 
moves into Port St. Joe, Apalachicola, and it's really set in East Point. I like Port St. Joe and Apalachicola. Oh yeah. They're, they're picture, they are genuinely picturesque places. Oh yes, I, and I was there when I wrote that novel. Uh -huh. I, I, have a, I had a little uh, 1961 Shasta camper that I had restored for travel, and I parked it down there, and I, I spent a lot of time writing. Uh, and we go down there a lot, anyway. I live about two hours, you know, east uh -huh, of uh -huh. there. All right. Now, this is an impossible question, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> For four years, you've about you've written one of these just about every day. Yes, sir. All right. Let's assume that you're going to live another fifty years. I hope so. Yeah, right. <laughs> that'd be nice. What What do you see down the road? Can you do this every day forever? Obviously, well, nobody can do everything every that, day forever. That's a good. What do you have? In, what do you have in your head? What do you What do you see down the road? That's a good question. I don't know. I you know, uh, I don't know. I I think uh, I've really gotten into the speaking and live storytelling. I can see myself doing that for the rest of my life. Uh huh. I know that I will be writing for the rest of my life. As far as columns for every day for the rest of my life. I, I could not say. You can't even say that out loud. I, I couldn't. I mean, even, no one could. Right? I couldn't. I couldn't. First, I couldn't begin to foresee partly because if you'd asked me five years ago if I would be doing what I'm doing now, sure, and sure. So, even sitting here with you of all people, I, I would have never guessed it. Never guessed mm. it, and I still can't even hardly believe it. Well, I'll be watching to see what it is you decide to do. Me too. <laughs> and as things go along, I hope you and I get together and chat again. I would love that. Thank you. I would love that. Thank you, This sir. has been a pleasure. Thank you.